working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. The next verse, and you can also take your seats. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God. The scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God. And it was credited to him as righteousness. Now I want to tackle a couple of things. One, just a few thoughts. You know, it's in the book of Genesis chapter 15 where God talks to Abraham. Or the, the statement is made which became the foundation of the entire doctrine of justification. In the book of Romans, Galatians, that is a foundation. Abraham believed God and that was counted to him as righteousness. And if you observe, Paul particularly brings out the theme that there is a righteousness that is not derived out of works, but by sheer faith in Christ. And that doctrine is completely built on this example primarily. But my question is this. When the Bible says Abraham believed God and is credited to him as righteousness, you know what it simply means? It's a technical term. That means Abraham gave God his faith. And God said, you know what? In return, I will give you my righteousness. That was the exchange that took place. And the Bible says that is available to us right now. A righteousness that is not based on works, but just by believing in Christ. That's an exchange that takes place. Now, let me go further. But the first question that would be asked, was that a prophecy or was that a statement? Because according to this particular passage, it says the scripture was fulfilled. So Abraham, did he have to do something for that scripture to be fulfilled? Or was that a statement which required nothing from Abraham other than his faith? Now that's a big question. Now I want to make it very clear. When God said in Genesis 15, or when that was written, Abraham believed God is credited to righteousness, it was not a futuristic prophetic word that needed to be fulfilled. It's a statement, a statement of truth that is based for generations to come. There's nothing prophetic about it. But what it means is, Abraham demonstrated that reality through an action. From God's side, it's a statement. Done forever. But Abraham, through an action, demonstrated that truth when he acted on faith. But faith, you know, in God, faith in Christ is the basis of our righteousness. That's a statement. That is a statement that does not need any more qualification. But here, what James is saying is that statement was demonstrated. And how did it get demonstrated? In verse number, James chapter 2, verse number 21 says, what is the act of Abraham? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son, Isaac on the altar. Now remember, what God told him was not after he offered his son on the altar. Believe me, it was in Genesis 15 when God said, Abraham believed God and it's counted to him as righteousness. And Paul repeats this even in his teaching in the book of Galatians. He says, the law came later, but the promise through faith came before that. And the law cannot annul, cannot cancel what was already done through promise in, by faith. Paul makes it clear. Now, look at me, please. I want to bring that faith element. When it says, I believe God, Abraham believed God. Now, that makes sense. You know, many a times we try to simplify the entire walk of Abraham when he goes to offer his son Isaac on the altar. Simplify it by saying, you know what? So, somebody says, how did Abraham deal with it? They say, you know what? He said, God will provide. But I have an issue with it. For the first time, I came to realization that is too simplified. That doesn't answer it. 
when Abraham says God shall provide, he was not truly handling or dealing with the issue of obedience. He did not say, you know what? Somehow I can, be, I can escape from obeying God by not offering Isaac. That is not what he meant. It was not Jehovah shall provide was the answer to that predicament. The two, you know, kind of uh, separate division in that particular in a walk of Abraham. First, he has to deal with obedience. So Abraham did not consider that God will somehow let him escape the, the burden of obe obeying God by just God providing something else. That was not the way he dealt with it. If that was the case, then this is, this is just kind of a, you know, there's not such substance to it. Abraham truly meant and truly believed that he's going to offer his son a sacrifice. He believed it. He did not find an alternative to that. Come on. Are you with me so far? Abraham did not say God will give me an alternative to that predicament. If that is the case, Abraham's obeying God is not as strong and as deep and cannot become the basis that makes him the father of faith. He did not say some of God magically will intervene and deliver my child. That was not what he be believed. Because he went and he was about to offer his son. He took the knife and God had to call his name twice. Abraham, Abraham. Because there was an urgency in that call. He was absolutely determined to do what God had called him to do or asked him to do. Offer his son on sacrifice. That today made my understanding of Abraham's journey much more difficult. And much more something that I can, you know, look from far and say how great a journey that was. Because I cannot even come to terms with, begin to understand what it all means. Are you with me so far? So you may ask me, why did he say that God will provide? How does that come to terms with the fact that Isaac shall be offered as a sacrifice? Now let's put that into some logical explanation. Even if Isaac is sacrificed and the obedient part is taken care of, he still need a lamb. Because lamb was what God will send as sacrificial animal. You know, but, but let me go a little more further into it. If Abraham sacrifices his son on the altar... What is the driving spiritual or faith thought that was in his heart? He did not believe that God will somehow send a lamb and prevent the sacrifice. That's not what he believed. He believed that God will allow him to sacrifice his son. And according to Hebrews chapter 11 verse number 9, I believe, he said in his heart, even if my son is sacrificed and become ashes, turn to ashes. God is able to bring him back to life. It was not a provision that Abraham had in his mind. That was the way he tackled the issue of sacrifice of his son. It was not provision. Mark my words. Provision was not the tool that he employed in order to deal with the issue of sacrifice of his son. Provision was not the key. Even though sometimes we like to say that's the key, that is wrong. It was resurrection. You have to separate provision and resurrection. Let me tell you this afternoon, my God can do both. He's a God of resurrection. He's also the God of provision. Can I get a shout of hallelujah in the house? But the predicament that Abraham faced was not handled through provision. Please don't make Abraham's journey of obedience reduced to somehow God will provide something and magically find a way out for him. That is not true. He believed that his son will be sacrificed. He believed that.
that he will lift the knife. He believed that he will plunge the knife into his son's beating chest. He believed that. And he was prepared for it. But yet he said, we will come back together. How can you believe both? And the writer of Hebrews says, by faith, he believed that God who gave him this promise, this child, is able to bring this child back from the ashes. Come on, church. This church must not just believe in the provision God. He had, this church has to believe in the resurrection God. A God who can resurrect things back to normal. Can I get somebody who believes that? I, I, I'm, I'm trying to push the envelope right now. I'm going to push your faith right now. He's not just a God who will prepare a way out for you, but He's a God who can bring things back to life. He's a God of resurrection. That's what, what Abraham believed. Hey. So next time when you quote that scripture, do not quote it. As a provision that prevented a sacrifice. That will be absolutely wrong. Because it was not a provision that prevented the sacrifice. It was resurrection according to Abraham. That would have prevented. Not prevented, at least that would have brought Isaac back. Now why did he say that? Because he said once upon a time. I came to an understanding that. My body and the wi my wife's body were as good as dead. And out of that, if God could bring a child, if God can bring a child from death, dead body, he can bring the child back from ashes. Church, my faith, I don't even know where it is against this kind of a faith. Because I'll tell you about my faith, where my faith struggles. You know, if I had believed in God, if I had believed in God, you know what my faith would be? I would believe that God, something about God, let's say He's a God who can do a miracle in this area. Or He's a God who can fulfill a promise miraculously. But right now, that if that was a base of Abraham's faith, that is about to be taken away. Because that one which he thought would be the miracle of his life forever is now taken away by God himself. And now where do you put your faith? Because you believe God is going to give you a child and through that child will be the destiny of your own and for the, for the kingdom of God and whatever God has spoken is now about to be terminated. So at that point of time, it's not a miracle. It's not that God had done a promise in the past. All those are good. That's believe in God. Believe in His promise. But he came to a realization, it's not even about the miracle that he did. It's not even about the promise he fulfilled. I believe him. <laughs> that means I can trust him as a God who will never change. Come on, somebody in this place, even though your promises are not fulfilled, can you still believe God? Can you still believe God? Can I'm going to repeat that once again. Maybe there was some kind of a, of a disappointment that you faced with something that God had spoken to you, yet not been accomplished, or something in that regard. But today, I want to challenge you. Is anybody who can say confidently, even though, I, yes, I thank God for the promises. I thank God for miracles. But I've come to a place. I believe Him. That means, hey, I believe in Him as a good God, as a powerful God, as a faithful God, and He knows what He's doing. Come on. I believe His character. That has been my, you know, cry before God. I have seen how people, you know, when they start a ministry, a miracle happens, and then the focus is all about miracle. Miracle one day can happen, next day may not happen, according to your plan. There's recently a situation in, in California, Bethel, 
where it was all about the movement. Yes, that child did not come back to life. But I have to kind of retrace my steps and declare even what I thought was the grand demonstration of God in my life is now being questioned. Yet, I believe him. Can I get somebody to understand what I'm trying to say? I believe him. I believe God. I believe not in his miracle. I believe him. Not if you believe that, can you shout a hallelujah? I believe him. I hope you're trying, you understand what I'm trying to say. Abraham has reached a point. Maybe at the beginning of his journey he didn't. But now through this journey is demonstrating that I not only believe that God can fulfill a promise, I believe him. That means even if the promise is taken away from me, he is still there. Hey, promise can change. Miracle can change. Situation in the morning can change to the evening. But one thing does not change. He, he is still there. On the last day of or last Sunday of this year, how many of you can say, my God is still the same? My God is still the same. Ah, uh, My God is still the same. My God is still the same. Abraham, Abraham believe God. Oof. That's the reason he thought, you know, please do not dis dismantle or discount Abraham's obedience by saying he just believes that God will somehow come through and give a lamb and get him out of it. No! The lamb is second part, part two. He believed first part one, my child will be burned, my child will die, and then, and then, because God had said in Genesis 21, 12, and Genesis 17, 11, he said, Isaac shall bear children. Come on. So if I know God, this temporary problem, that Isaac is going to be burned, as long as God is a consistent, God remains God. I still believe because of him, even if the promise is dead, even if the miracle is dead, even if that child has become ashes, God remains the same. God. Hey, can I hear somebody who can celebrate in spite of the ups and downs in my life? God remains the same. I believe God. Hey. Hallelujah. 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 God. It has to be God. I declare to you, there's a move that's going to come upon this church. But we will not idolize the movement. We will not follow the movement. We will not idolize revival. We will not idolize healing ministry. We will not idolize even if dead, dead are raised. That is not our focus because that can still be dead. But we idolize the God. The God. God. That is a problem with many, many of our churches. A move starts from that day onwards, they're living only for the movement. Movement, movement, movement. Brothers and sisters, movement can die after one year. And where are you going to go back to? And that's the reason they say when revival strikes, a lot of people go into backsliding because they expected a movement. They expected it to happen every time. But it doesn't follow that pattern. Abraham, the biggest one thing that kept you was this Isaac birth. Everything is revolved around it. And now he's going to die. Abraham believed that resurrection will come. The God, he did this miracle first time when my body was dead. That God can bring him back from ashes. 
let me tell you, your faith is going to rise up. Some of you are believing God for providence. But today you're going to believe God for resurrection. Come on. If you believe in God, you can believe somehow God will do something for you. But if you believe God, you know all things are possible. Come on, can I repeat that? When you believe in God, you can believe in something from God. Maybe he will do this. Maybe he will do that. Something that God will do. But if you believe God, you believe whatever God is, is God. Come on, there's no difference. He can do all things. So Abraham is not believing in God as a God who kept his word. He's believing God as a God who can raise the dead. So can I declare today, two things are going to come out of this church. Number one, people who believe God. Hey, my miracle has not happened today, but I believe. Can I get a witness somewhere here? My healing has not come through, but I believe God. I believe God. I believe God. I believe my God. And if you believe that, two things are going to, this is a prophetic word. Maybe it's a prelude to what is going to come. Resurrection that can handle any kind of a situation will be the first part. Number two, when your son comes back, you still need a sacrifice. Problem number two. So Abraham's faith was about the second part. My son will come back. He'll be resurrected from the dead, from the ashes. But then I still have a problem. I, the sacrifice must happen. And at that point, he said, God will provide. So he was able to handle the first one through resurrection and peep through that into a second one called provision. Church, many people start with provision and cannot go further. But we see resurrection. And through resurrection, we see provision. So Abraham, when he said that faith statement, in his heart he has already dealt with the first resurrection problem. And then he's talking about the provision. So let me ask you today, when you're praying for provision next year, can you believe God? As a resurrection. As a resurrector. He can take care of any issue. I believe him. And let's put that into action. Are you, it's kind of a little complex. But are you able to understand this? The the thing that you hear loud, Jehovah Jireh, God will provide, is the issue to do the second part of the problem. Not the first part. Because the first part, he believed ashes. He's seeing his son burned into ashes, and suddenly all the ashes coming back together. And coming up and saying, Daddy, that's what he believed. I want some of you to walk out of this place. Because what happens is, if your faith is in what God did, when so tomorrow God, maybe it didn't happen, you will be tested. God, I believe, you know what? You can see from YouTube, something miraculous happened. Praise God for it. It will stir your faith. And the next day you read something that didn't happen. What do you do? But today your faith is going, going to go back to basics. I believe God. Church, we'll pray today. But I want to share maybe two stories. In Esther night, I was sitting with Pastor Danes. And that's the reason I thought, you know what? I came here to celebrate the fact that God has done miracles for our own people, not in Africa. Here, 
And then the enemy got agitated. But today we declare, I believe God. So Pastor Danes told me as to be we had gone for dinner. He told us half last 31st night he was in the emergency. Because his lungs started to cause problem. And there the doctors found, I could be wrong, I'm just trying to figure out a few things. The doctors found that he's got a very bad lungs. And they gave him, according to him, about 24. He's even said it could be more than that. Every 15, 20 minutes he has to do this puff. Because the condition of his lungs is so bad. He told, he told us if he sits, he just had to sit. He'll exert that much energy out of him. So bad, even sitting was becoming extraordinarily difficult. And then they found different kinds of allergy that he has to avoid everything. Everything. And when this happened, he said that night, probably it's the first Jan, he went back to his house and he said he had to put three pillows in order to kind of, what do you call, reduce the impact of what his lungs was doing to him and to kind of hold, you know, his lungs intact and every organ is now doing extra work to keep him breathing. That night he said, as a true Christian, he didn't use that word, I'm using it. He said, God, if my time has come for me to leave, I have to prepare to come into eternity. So he said it took some time to pray. He confessed sins that he, has, he remembers. And he asked the Lord to help him with sins that he has forgotten. So he can meet his master. But he was getting ready for this to happen if it were to happen. But he said that night I slept. Early morning he has this dream. He said he was on a plane with so many people in the plane and he's flying at about 35,000 feet in the air and suddenly he saw the plane started to descend sharply and started to, what's the word? It's now descending or not descending in a nice way, it's crashing. So it's just going on a tailspin, it's coming down to crash. And he says, he knows what was going to happen because in the dream he felt his time is now up. And then he said the second scene was he saw the cemetery. And he saw, he can see himself standing there and watching people from our church walking by. And everybody walking by is saying the same thing. This is where Pastor Danes is buried. And he died of a bad lungs. He kept on here and he can hear people walking by the cemetery and saying the same thing. But he said as he was watching, in the dream, something comes upon him which he can't explain. It was the Holy Spirit intervening. And a prayer rose from his heart which he did not manufacture. And this was his prayer. Lord, you are the lover of my soul, the keeper of my destiny, and the protector of my life. If so, I refuse to accept this illness to dictate my life. If and when you call me, I will be more than ready to come to be with you. But until then, you are the glory and the lifter of my head. What a powerful prayer. I'm ready to come, but I don't want the enemy to take me out with the sickness. So from that day onwards, things started to change. It was not overnight, things started to change. He went back to doctors. He had about 70, around 70 as the, as a rate or what he called the, 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 the strength of his, of his lungs and suddenly it changes to 95 and the doctor says, you don't need my help anymore. And then last fasting prayer, he had this test where the doctors gave him a clear lungs. Yeah. 
But it doesn't stop there. About a month back, you know how many of you know Pastor Danes was a badminton player who has represented Singapore, you know, in those days when he was growing up. I think Singapore is Malaysia. Malaysia, Singapore. He was a basket, I'm sorry, a badminton player. And he's not played for many years. But last month or so, he had, there was a tournament in the city. And he was the oldest person in that particular team or the team that he's playing against. All of them are young people, and he's not played for over 20 years. And let me tell you, he beat all of them. And he's got a trophy. His lungs is functioning perfect. Last 31st night, last 31st night, that was a miracle. And I thank God. Pastor Daines told me he could have been gone any time. But today he says, every day I feel energy. There's no more treatment. God is keeping his lungs. And today, before the next watch night service, we declare... God has healed. God is faithful. So I want to say this testimony, and then, you know, I said, God, will I be able to say that? Something told me, no matter what happens, I want to testify today. Because the enemy doesn't like testimonies. But we are declaring, God who did it once, he will do it again. Come on, could you give Jesus Christ, the faithful Son of God, a praise in the house of the Lord, everybody? Just worship Him, just worship. This is the last Sunday, give Him some good worship, for He has been... So I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. Do not forget 31st night. This day is significant. I don't know, maybe prophets can confirm it, but this day is significant. And I know, I felt even to enter this moment was not going to be easy. Those are warfare. But now that we have come, we are looking forward to say, God, you brought us this far. And we will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of a living. We will see what God will do. So how many of you can say two things? One, in spite of what you have gone through, he has remained faithful. Number two, because he is good, goodness and mercy shall follow you all the days of your life. The days ahead are going to be filled with the goodness of the Lord. If you believe that, can you give him a praise for what he did? And praise for what he's going to do. Come on, give it up for Jesus. Do not forget 31st night. Invite your friends. This place will be full. A lot of people will come. You know, we will enter the new year with praise. Jesus has won the victory. The devil is defeated. He has won the victory. So, Father, Pastor Dino, would you please come? Pray a word over the people, and then just a few words. And then we'll have the announcement. Just a word. Just a word. Just a word. Just a word. Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful afternoon for us to come together and to enjoy your presence. Lord, the enemy can plan and plot, but you have the ultimate victory. And so, Lord, today we enforce the victory that you won on the cross. We thank you for the life and the abundance of life that you have given to us. And this afternoon, we are together enforcing that victory. The devil is defeated and Jesus is victorious. And we are following a victorious Savior. And the triumph and procession will keep going forward. It will not stop over at any junction 
of hindrances, but rather we are going to cross over and go into the promises of God. We will inherit the promises. We will enjoy the land flowing with milk and honey. We thank you for the healing that you've already started in the life of Andy Molly. From head to toe, we together again enforce that victory. And we say it is already done. We thank you for the resurrections that are going to happen. And at the end of it all, we will together declare, we believe God. We believe God. Zion believes God. Together we believe God. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of Elijah and Elisha. The God of our fathers. We thank you so much for what you're doing in this time and in this season. Bless your people. We declare the word Shalom. We bless our pastor. We thank you for the wonderful promises. We thank you for the testimony. We thank you for the working of God. We thank you for how you connect things together. We love you, Lord. This is only a beginning. And our todays and yesterdays will pale in comparison to the future that you have in store for us. We give you praise and glory. In Jesus' name we pray.